we're very lucky to have Sarah here. She's Professor of Politics and Gender at Royal Holloway. Uh, she joined us only in May of 2020, so like me, she gets around campus a little bit now. Um, she previously worked at Brookback College and at the University of Bristol. Her research centers around the theory and practice of women's representation, gender and political parties, parliaments and institutional change. She has published four research books, New Labour Women's MPs, Women in British Party Politics, uh, Sex, Gender, and the Conservative Party, and her most recent one, Feminist Democratic Representation, with Karen Cielis, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. She's also published a number of influential research articles and received the UK Political Studies Association Special Recognition Award. She's also impacted the real world in all sorts of wonderful ways. Uh, she was in 2009-2010 Special Advisor to the UK Parliament Speaker Conference on Representation and in 2014 Special Advisor to the All-Party Parliamentary Group, Women in Parliamentary Inquiry. She also published a pamphlet book, something, I don't know if that's what called, <laughs> called The Good Parliament. Uh, which is, it's a tome. Tome, there we go. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm called the Good Parliament Report, which identified a series of reforms to make the UK House of Commons more diversity sensitive. On her recommendations, a new group of MPs, the Commons Reference Group on Representation and Inclusion was established by the Speaker, a new group which serves that she served as a specialist advisor. She has authored a number of reports on gender and representation, and I think is the world leading expert on <laughs> feminist democratic representation. So uh, she's going to talk to us today about making political institutions feminist, and I look forward to hearing it. Thanks very much, Laura. I should add, I'm only going to be one of the leading experts on feminist democratic representation because I co authored with my great friend in Brussels, Karen Cedis, and she'll kill me if I don't mention the fact that it was completely co authored. We wrote it over three years. Plenty of summers in Italy, um, working very, very hard. Actually, I think we did a lot more sunbathing, a lot more prosecco drinking. We didn't. It took us a long, long time to do. So, I will talk about a lot about Karen in this lecture too. But I think it's really important to say that up front. And I'm using a computer that isn't a Mac, so just bear with me on the technology. Okay. But anyway, before I describe these two uh, pieces of work to you, I do want to thank Laura and the Gender Institute for hosting this. Um, seminar tonight and thank you that my real live audience is really nice I, I had visions of it just being <laughs> um, but I really appreciate it and Adam thank you for coming too but really keen to see some real students uh, it's amazing what you miss um, during COVID in those times so it has been great to be part of the Gender Institute and to work on gender political science over the last two years and I'm loving this topic of the clash if you like or perhaps the um, complementarity between part of my work which became very theoretical but other work that was really on the ground and very political in the sense that the actual documentation that I wrote in the Good Parliament report this is maybe really worth stating up front this isn't what necessarily I think solves all the problems it's a political document aimed at a particular audience at a particular time where very much you're negotiating the institutional politics the wider political context and then a piece of work feminist democratic representation with Karen, where we were playing with ideas in a way that we've not ever done so before, both in terms of a book length study, but also becoming, if you like, people who do empirical work and conceptual work trying to do political theory. So that's an interesting one too. So they're very different pieces of work, these two texts. So the Good Parliament report was impactful, Laura's already used that term, but impact is an increasing part of the academics career or the academic the dimensions to our work it's about changing the world as well as studying the world affecting change that we hopefully i would want to say improves the world around us so as i said it was a very political document it was a fantasy report and i stress that in the report itself but it's not what i imagine the ideal parliament could be but actually much more how within this moment with these politicians around me with these kind of criticisms and likely resistance, what is achievable, but at the same time trying to also recognise that I have other audiences who might also hold me to account to very different standards, and I'll say a bit more about that later. It's also quite a dry, it's boring, it's 40,000 words, 
I think it, it lacks some of the the flavour that I'd like to see in my writing a lot more, but again, you're trying to meet the set standards for the audience. This is going to be politicians reading this, and in fact, actually, they're probably only at best going to read the executive summary anyway, and I didn't even know what an executive summary was before I wrote this report, but luckily I had a, a former student who was at that time a PhD student who did, she'd been in the lobbying world, and so she enabled me to write something with much shorter sentences and much shorter words that actually we hoped the parliamentarians would read. We then expected their advisors or their officials and clerks of the House to actually read the whole of the report. So it's a, it's a, it's a report that contains technically appropriate and politically viable reforms. As I said, Feminist Democratic Representation, written with Karen Seelis, was our first foray into, as I said, the long length political theory. It was a defence of representative democracy, which is not terribly fashionable, and I'll say more about that. But it's about trying to imagine how representation might be if we allowed ourselves to play with that concept and how we would make it feminist to really redress what we call the poverty of women's political representation. And it makes uh, a case for some augmentations to our political institutions, to our elected political institutions. And what I want to do in today's talk is to try to draw lessons from both of those as I think Karen and I are increasingly rather kind of pretentiously causing ourselves democratic designers. We're trying to refashion institutions. And what's really interesting is that though, although these are two very different pieces of work, they really speak to each other very well when you try to think, actually, if you were going out now to design and create, particularly with uh, feminist activists and those concerned about inequalities in politics, how you might actually create a process that would engender the kind of institution that we would think would deliver the good representation for women and within that, the diverse women. So we're designing and trying to build feminist institutions, particularly if we get a grant we've just written because that would really enable us to try to build them. Um, and really to think about how do we make a good parliament, whatever that might mean. This drawing is based on a real photograph of a French protest. And for Karen and I, this is, this is in our book, it illustrates one of the key elements to this thing we call the poverty of women's political representation. And it's speaking to this idea that there's a lack of responsiveness to women in our politics, that politicians too often are able to easily ignore the representative demands, interests, needs, preferences of women. It's too often fought over by men over seemingly gender neutral political terrain that oftentimes we would want to suggest is highly gendered. But where women's issues are discussed, they are often misrepresented. So others speak to or seek to and states they are claiming and representing in the interests of women. But oftentimes for strategic, perhaps party political reasons, so for other instrumental gains, as opposed to what we might think of as honourable responses to women. So the kind of issues where a political party might become active are probably working for a political party in a way that may not mean that the needs, interests, preferences of women are actually addressed. So we can think about political agenda that are skewed against women, where women's interests get partially represented. So some of the story or some of the issue is talked about, but other perhaps more difficult, problematic, contested aspects of that are not. But we really felt that there's too often too little capacity amongst politicians to either know about or care about women's interests. So we see a disconnect between many women and representative politics. This diagram is, and if you're one of my first years, you see, saw this in the lecture last week that I gave. This is again a drawing from this time a Twitter picture of lots of young women exiting an Irish airport. They had come home to participate in the referendum on the uh, Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution. And there were many pictures on Twitter of lots and lots of young women returning, whether that was by plane or by ferry. They had to be in the country to participate. And this referendum would allow their elected representatives, the members of the Irish Parliament, to legislate on abortion. And one of the posters that was spotted in Dublin at the time by, by my younger brother said, 
vote no, you can't trust women. And I found that a really powerful questioning of our membership, of women's membership, of the political community, of the public. And I wondered whether that wasn't why all these women spent lots of money, including crowd sourcing their tickets back from Australia in their gap years, those kind of things, to return home, because they couldn't trust others to do good by them. And it's it's kind of, um, I don't know, it still sends shivers down my spine. I know that's a cliche, but when I think about those images, and precisely what was at stake in this moment of political decision. Now, I'm absolutely somebody who supports the principle of descriptive representation. We don't have parity very, in very many places around the world, and particularly in democracies. So a large part of this thing called the poverty of women's representation does lie in their numerical or their descriptive underrepresentation. But it should not be reduced to it. And of course, it raises questions of which women are present in our institutions. So which voices are included and heard and responded to, and which are more marginalized and, and or absent? So the question really here is to what extent are the claims being made about women, decisions being made that will affect women, being taken by others, not by them or with them, or in ways that fail to respond to their stated preferences and their interests. So that disconnect I talked about is that in many ways lies in the fact that our political party systems make it very easy to ignore large groups, despite our numerical majority, the way in which political parties crystallise their sense of interest, their understandings, goes back generations and are linked to most often, you know, class politics or region uh, and religion politics, those kind of cleavages of the 19th century. And it seems to me it's very hard to hold our politicians to account very often for the misrepresentations of women in their politics. And so this idea that getting more women into Parliament, which has been a huge part of the campaign of feminist activists, of party feminists, to really transform the selection and the election of women into our parliaments, is not something I would dispute. I think it's fundamentally important for reasons of justice, for symbolism, but we always have to ask, and then what? And which women are made present? And without that sense of accountability, that enables those who are present to not transform their politics or not to become more responsive. So this idea of what we've called first generation feminist democratic design was to change who sits in our institutions. And in all sorts of ways, that remains a fundamental task. In the absence of equality or parity of representation, it must still be part of what is argued for. So I'm publicly on the record in favour of quotas. You might not like them. I kind of don't care. They work. The evidence is there. Follow the evidence. Let's have them. That's my quick way of answering uh, why we should have quotas. But actually, it's not enough. Because in, in so many ways, women elected representatives find themselves marginalised even when they enter. So their presence is not sufficient. And it also, I think, has to be recognised that, that if those women are skewed themselves relative to the makeup of women in society, then the potential for them to also misrepresent is at least an empirical question to be considered. You know, we know that women do not share the same views. We're very good at recognising differences of experiences, differences of party ideology, and therefore, we could also, it seems to me, need to recognise differences amongst feminists. Even. So the idea that there is a women's sort of what I would call shopping bag of interests that should be brought into an institution and acted upon, but, you know, is, is a misreading of that diversity. And in fact, the competition, the contestation over what constitutes women's interests. So, yes, we want more descriptive representation. Yes, we want more diverse descriptive representation. But if we don't transform the institutions and we don't transform the politics and the ability for those elected representatives, who I should add often get the responsibility to do all this transformative work, get you know, it is it, left unexplored. So we have to recognise that there are other dimensions of representation out there. Many of you will know about them. We often talk about symbolic, substantive, so acting for. Increasingly, we can talk about effective representation, the role of emotions and how people feel in terms of attachment and 
uh, belonging, those kinds of ideas. But actually, rather than, than maintain this rather disaggregated understanding of representation, so we either count them and think that's descriptive, again, some of the first years perhaps, uh, you'll remember this from the lecture a couple of weeks ago, or thinking about how one feels symbolised or the way in which women and gender is made symbolic in our parliaments, rather than seeing those as discrete or, or exploring them in pairs, what we have to do is think of, of this idea of representation in the round. And Karen and I use the, the phrase or the term melange to try to capture this idea that they, they work in interesting ways. And I'm using this kind of weird hand signal now because it reminds me of the uh, intersectionality uh, metaphor of Damoon and this idea of swirls as the mixture changes. So what are we trying to do with this thinking about, if we're going to try and design, redesign our political institutions, we're going to make them more feminist. What is it that we are trying to capture? What's the essence? And this uh, picture is the now, like, you know, quite widely um, known now, at least in the States, what is, is, the, is the Kavanaugh lift moment, okay? And what we take from this picture is the way in which a powerful politician here looking incredibly crestfallen and not quite sure where to put himself, is being forced to hear from the kind of women that normally he doesn't confront. These are women survivors of violence against women who are confronting him for supporting the nomination to the Supreme Court in the US. And what he can't do is escape because if he closes the lift doors, he looks like he's fleeing. He can't exit because in the larger um, Twitter images, and the video of this, you can see there are camera crews and crowds. He is trapped. He is forced to confront those who otherwise he would not be made to listen to. And so whilst in lots of ways this scenario might be, might be read as a failure, because ultimately we know that Kavanaugh gets you know, put on the Supreme Court, what we do see in this moment is the essence of that idea of powerful men silenced in the face of very passionate women demanding to know, why are you doing this? Why are you rejecting the interpretation that is coming from these particular women? So he can't pretend afterwards he hasn't heard what they've had to say. Right, he's being confronted. It is public, it's a public moment. It's viral, you know, we can see this. There is evidence to say, you have been in a place where this was said in front of you. You can't deny you don't know. The question then becomes, and do you care? And how do we make these representatives care? So he, he was witness to what they said, and he's called upon then to account for the decisions he makes thereafter. Will he take this seriously? Will he respond in some kind of way? Now, what we take from this moment is this idea that actually what we're trying to design are institutions that procedurally encapsulate, incorporate, make manifest feminist principles. So we're making institutions feminist by trying to, to create structures, processes, norms, procedures that are inclusive, that are responsive, and that are egalitarian. And they're inclusive to the extent to which they recognise women's heterogeneous interests, including the most marginalised. That they take account when they deliberate and when they make decisions of that diversity of women's interests, interests beyond the organised women's movements, beyond those which have power and voice and resources. And it's about, when we come to the idea of egalitarianism, the relative status of those diverse voices. So what we do in feminist democratic representation is to try to conceive of, at a slightly abstract level, a process of representation where we augment existing systems. So this is not starting from a blank page. It's trying to look at the normal ways in which we think about representation and representative institutions and see how we can augment it. And so what we do is to design a process where we have two new moments. Oh, if, I'm, if I'm moving away from my screen, I'm going to move away from my video. Oh, well, sorry, folks. OK, so we have two new moments of group advocacy and account giving. OK, and what we are trying to ensure by bringing in a new set of representatives that we've called the affected representatives of women, that in those two new moments of advocacy and account giving, 
that these affected representatives of women are able to put in front, just like in that lift moment, the partial, passionate experiences and interests of those who are affected. And then there are that normal moment of deliberation and decision making to hold elected representatives to account for the quality of their deliberation and their decisions. So that ultimately they are judged by these affected representatives of women. So who are these affected representatives of women and how are they going to function? Now, we use the word affected representatives of women to try to capture this idea that these representatives, who may not be women, we might think and imagine that they probably mostly will be, but they need not be in principle, but they are those who would be experientially close to the issue in hand. And they would be brought in to a parliament to make sure that those voices are heard in that moment of group advocacy and thereafter to hold those elected representatives to account. If you remember, I talked about this idea of trying to ensure that our elected representatives who remain the decision makers, we don't make them equal, we make them equal of sorts. So they are still representatives of women, but they don't make the decisions. But what they're able to do is to marshal those experiences and the passionate advocacy of those they represent to make those elected representatives care about representing women well, but also knowing enough to actually make good decisions. So in these two new moments, you've got a new set of representatives who are brought in. And what's important about this is it's not just another example of a little hearing where you speak to a few women's groups, the ones who are organised, the ones who are normally part of the lobbying world. It's not an invitation that is please come and we'll listen to you. This is about an institutional requirement to recognise that these are actors, equal of sorts, who must be brought in. And without that, it's too easy for those elected representatives just to ignore those outside, those in the hallway, those at the edge of the lift, if you like, shouting. Now, feminist democratic representation is at the, a sort of quite a general level. So it doesn't provide specific blueprints about how this might work in practice. And some of the reviews of the book, quite clear, um, would like us to have written a second book about how we identify these effective representatives and what kind of civil society are we presuming. We start with quite a lot of presumptions of a healthy civil society, of a plurality of views and of the ability of institutions to provide the kind of resources that those groups who might be the most marginalised would need to be able to access in order to play this advocacy role. But we do talk about the ways in which some of the traditional norms of participation and of talk within political institutions will need to be transformed. Because otherwise you already have created an institutional interaction where those who are the most marginalised will not be speaking the right kind of language and therefore we seem to be poor representatives. So we've got to transform that too. But anyway, FDR is a general theory. It's not about specific blueprints. You can't read FDR um, and then think, okay, in this parliament, this is how we do it. It has to be applied. It has to be specific and contextualized and invo involve a process of feminist democratic design that co-creates within a particular moment and context. In fact, that's the work Karen and I are currently working out. So to build these feminist democratic institutions has to be very specific to a time and location. And it should be undertaken in a feminist fashion. And therefore the idea that two academics can design this without collaborating with those on the ground. So some of the work that we're currently doing is looking at the ways in which you might imagine and trial actually the kind of experiments that would see groups of women coming together with the kind of people who normally populate our representative elected institutions to actually create these kind of processes. So that is the quickest snapshot I've ever done of feminist democratic representation. I hope Karen's not listening because she'll probably tell me I've skipped over some things too much. Anyway, this is my, it's actually what Hazel McCubrey is, who's the artist who did this for us. This is our facadism picture, the kind of architecture that normally gets terribly bad press but for some reason I sometimes quite like it even in real life not just as a, as a metaphor for what we're doing in our book there's a rather wonderful building at the back of um, the Oxo building in central London it's got these wonderful 
columns and then there's an amazing sort of new town, uh, it's not a town block, but it's a sort of a low rise block of flats, but it's maintained. It's, and I think it's rather dramatic and rather lovely. And there's also a wonderful building in Toronto that I also think of when I see this picture. So what I want to do now is really shift the tone of the talk. So it's going to very feel like a very different piece and that's part of the, um, the fun, I would like to say. Okay, so we've got this facadism, very unfashionable. The fashionable thing to do, really, I would argue, is, is to burn our institutions down metaphorically, of course, right? Let's start from scratch and build up. And there is a case for that, but we're going to argue that we should hold on to the front of our institutions, but nonetheless radically transform them. So I'm now going to take you back five years when I invited myself into the House of Commons, determined to change it. There's lots of stories about how I invited myself in, mostly they involve alcohol and feeling that if, if I could just let myself in, I could sort it out. And the alcohol obviously um, enabled me to have a very uh, arrogant sense of my own ability and a failure to massively identify the resistance that, that would be in place. But anyway, I was going to apply the Interparliamentary Union's gender-sensitive Parliament's framework to the British House of Commons, give me a few months and I'll sort it. Um, and in lots of ways, it was quite good having that outsider view because in some ways what it meant was, at least initially, I think, that I wasn't constrained by the way in which the house works. But I'll say a lot more about those kind of negotiations um, in a moment. But the reason why I switched to this idea in this talk is because I think the gender sensitive parliament approach is a foremother of feminist democratic design. So kind of weirdly, these two strands of my, my work, one which was the more theoretical work with Karen, the other which was my much more practical, engaged, impactful work, hanging around the House of Commons, talking to parliamentary clerks and officials, becoming friends with some of those, beginning to well, I've known quite a few MPs for a number of years by this stage. But that kind of very practical work on the ground actually comes together in this idea of feminist democratic design. So it's a form of gender sensitive parliaments. As I said, I invited myself in, which of course always begs the question, well, how did I manage to gate crash it? And in some sense, I was already something of an insider and that begs other questions about that insider outsider role and when, when you do find yourself becoming socialized into the institution. But that academic arrogance was a, was a really important aspect of inviting myself in. I was confident I knew what was wrong. And that was really important when I was contested, when I was faced with particularly uh, small C and large C conservative men who were trying to tell me that my feminist knowledge was wrong. It really mattered that I had some academic arrogance in the sense that there was so much feminist literature out there that told me what the problems were. Right? There was global literature and I knew that this was not right, if you like. So I began to think I could be a feminist institutional designer, although I didn't use that term at the time. And I also thought I could be a feminist critical actor. And again, I didn't use that term, but the current book I'm working on, I'm exploring the possibility that that concept of critical actor mm -hmm can be extended to include this thing I'm calling at the moment the aspirant or the putative feminist academic critical actor. And it's this category of critical actor that isn't just studying change in institutions, but is making herself or themselves present to instigate and institute feminist change. So academic arrogance, feminism was driving this. With Rosie Campbell, I've written about the feminist imperative to transform as well as study the world. Mm -hmm. Impact is a big contested aspect, I mentioned it right at the beginning uh, of the academic career as another dimension that we have to kind of fulfill. It can be wonderful, it can be very time consuming, and it can be very risky. But nonetheless, I believe in a feminist imperative. I'm not sure you can really be a feminist if you don't want to change the world. Anyway, I'll leave that for perhaps a question. Talked about the role of having alcohol and making that just make it everything seem a bit more doable. I don't want to stress that too much, but nonetheless, it comes up in another number of occasions, the moments where I've started to try and change things in the world. So I do wonder if it has a role to play. There was also an email, and this ties in with the academic and the institutional and the governance of higher education. There was now suddenly money to do this kind of work. So I was able to access money that meant I wasn't teaching for a semester, so I could literally go and live in Parliament for three months. Without that money, it wouldn't have been easy. If I hadn't lived in London, it wouldn't have been possible. If I'd had three children, it would have been very difficult. So we need to think about the way in which being an impactful academic is not 
the same for everyone. There are equality and diversity and inclusion aspects to this agenda too. Anyway, I filled the form, invited myself in, they let me in. So I knew quite a few MPs from work that I'd done back in the 1990s. I knew quite a few of the clerks through what's called the study of parliament group. I'm not going to bore you with any details about this other than to try to emphasise that these things do not just happen. If you're inviting yourself in and getting in, it often is a consequence of very small acts over a number of years that mean that when you invite yourself in, they think of you. And I talk about this to my clerks who are predominantly the very senior ones, older uh, white men, is that they, I was kind of their feminist, right? They weren't always quite sure what I was thinking or what I wanted to do, but I was one of them. And that's because I had hung out at Oxford conferences you know, the kind of place where you forget that you've got to sit on a bench and try and climb over it in a skirt to have cups of tea opposite lots of men in the weekend after New Year, because it was always held then because, and this is, I don't know if this is the, the truth or not, but the story goes, they want to get away from their families after Christmas and New Year, and there's a menswear sale on the high street. So, you know, all of the politics, the gender politics of academia and parliament come together in that moment. But I'd also undertaken a number of advising roles. Laura mentioned some of those at the beginning, and that, again, created some credibility. I mentioned maybe 10 minutes ago now about that notion of feminist knowledge being contested. So you're trying to reconcile those identities where you're, you're there feminist, but you're bringing in a set of knowledge that is, that is challenging and questioned. So I needed a strategy. Um, anybody listening who's thinking about impact, I mean, I didn't have a strategy. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? So lots of this is reconstructing back, because those of you doing dissertations, this idea that you set out in nice, neat stages how you do your empirical research, right? I didn't really know what I was doing. I managed to kind of convince my then university, Bristol, that I knew what I was doing. I told them I could make this change, right? I mean, in all sorts of ways. You're basically flogging this idea that you can change an institution in advance. I had no idea. But I would identify diversity sensitivities, create some reforms, identify who could be made responsible and try to work out the ways in which I could make them responsible. That idea of making uh, those who had the ability or the authority to act to do so. And I created through talking to my friends within Parliament, but also particularly my I now call my feminist in residence, Chloe Challender, who was then chair of the Workplace Equality Network, Harley Gender. She became my feminist in residence. Really important because when I was feeling exhausted, battered, concerned, she would keep me focused on the feminism of the institution, or rather the need to feministize, if that's a rather ugly word, but nonetheless one that I think is worth trying to use. I had an MPs panel. I had an advisory board of clerks and officials, senior clerks, and of course, I just mentioned Chloe, uh, my feminist in residence. So I was going to hang out in Parliament. That's what the textbooks say. You know, the uh, father of political ethnography or parliamentary ethnography, Richard Fenner, hanging about, soaking food. I hadn't even read his book. I mean, this is terrible kind of research design. But I didn't think at the time that's what I was doing. I just thought I was going in there. So that's raise quite interesting questions when you reconstruct. When I now look at the literature on ethnography, parliamentary ethnography, some of the advice that is used raises questions for the feminist parliamentary ethnographer. The idea of flattery, for example, is really risky if you're, you know, much younger, or at least people think you're much younger than the men that you're engaging with. Do you really want to flatter members of parliament? Does that not risk in an institution that we now know is saturated? by um, gender and, of course, we've had scandals around gendered bullying and sexual harassment and sexual violence in the institution. So flattery as a way of creating reactions and relationships and rapport with individuals is something I had to think about. So I needed to create this reform. If you, if you remember, I've got to create this shopping bag of reforms. And in order to do that, I need them to be technically appropriate because the parliament is full of very clever people on the technical side, like the clerks and the officials, they know how it works. It's not how it works as defined in the text. Then you need to make sure that these reforms are politically viable because there's nothing worse than a report that gets left on the shelf. Remember I said I wrote a very dry report. I wrote a long one, everything was kind of backed up. I very strategically deployed pictures quotations, made sure they were, you know, all the parties. So very 
uh, tried to ensure that you couldn't misread it as a partisan document, as a document that did not understand how the institution worked. So there's all the technically appropriate, but politically appropriate is something that I think on reflection, it took a long time to learn about. And I'm not sure that necessarily you always get it. Even when you're really hanging about an institution from, in the end, it was from sort of September 2015 until the report was published, I think in the July now, but it was got a bit delayed by Brexit, which <clears throat> has got other, other, other impacts on, on this work too. But nonetheless, this idea of, um, needing the technical and political knowledge how would i acquire that and what was quite interesting is that the clerks and officials would also give me political inside knowledge because they obviously know the members of parliament very well too so we might want to think about the ideas of clerkly impartiality and professionalism and how i might have benefited from those aspects of their own kind of norms of being but the political side Clearly, I wanted to be very careful that I didn't put any reforms out there before I was very certain that there was no way a member of parliament could say I would get it wrong. Because that's that sense of being credible, particularly when you are bringing a critical approach to the institution, and an institution like the House of Commons, any sense of which that you are misunderstanding something just renders you immobile. And I think particularly when you have got people who will directly contest your reading of an institution, you have to be very sure of yourself, otherwise you just, I think you just lose any confidence that what you're saying makes sense. So there were a couple of moments where I was talking about particular aspects to parliament where I would be told I was wrong. And I also witnessed moments where the voices of women MPs, which had been collected by the institution itself, they were told that they had got the institution wrong. So that silencing of feminist knowledge was really very powerful and quite difficult to um, cope with, to manage, to resist yourself, to not actually begin to think, well, am I misreading this scenario in some way? And this is where I really began to think about this idea of institutionalization, the necessity of thinking through really some sort of the big P politics of gender sensitive parliaments reform, but also the small P. So if the, if the big P is the sort of institutional, in the sense of parties, groups, government, opposition, executive, legislative relations, some of these, I guess you might have studied in, in other courses at Royal Holloway, but this notion that you're having to really grapple with some of the core dynamics, the very well recognised dynamics of British politics, but at the same time also to think about some of those that you don't always see, the institutional in terms of the administrative rather than political side of the house, so the internal politics. How do you identify those actors who will work with you and who will resist? And to think particularly about who those opponents are going to be and how you will try to negate their influence. And of course, they can be very vocal. They have access to the media. They are able to mobilise against you. You often rely on some key people supporting you. And if you lose the support of some of those, then some of your reforms will disappear. So if you think about it, I'm creating this report. I'm trying to sort of refashion this institution, keeping the front of the institution metaphorically in place, but trying to do as much as I can behind it to turn it into something that is more, according to the IPU, gender sensitive. I shifted to a diversity sensitive framework, which I shall just say in a moment. But what was really important to this, this moment of institutionalization, this is the one chapter in my current book that I haven't yet written, so I should get better on the institutionalization, looking back and critiquing my own efforts and how well did I do it. And the answer is I didn't do it, I didn't do it well enough to have ensured the ongoing success of some of these reforms and I don't know whether that as yet is to do with me or the fact just how difficult it is this institution to transform and I suspect it's a combination of both of those two things but it did require the creation of a new institution Laura mentioned it in the introduction this group called the Commons Reference Group on representation inclusion there was no group or institution or actor or sets of actors in the House of Commons as was to drive this kind of agenda forward. So we had to create something new. 
And that new institution survived as long as there was support cross-party for the institution and the speaker. And what you found and what we experienced as Brexit really began to dominate and party politics, coupled with the politics of gendered bullying and harassment in the House meant that this institution could not, sub, could not survive the strength of those dynamics. And I think that's really fascinating and something I will be investigating a great deal more. So I shifted from gender sensitive to diversity sensitive parliaments. And there's a lot more that I need to say about this, but I, I won't be able to say it so much in this, in this lecture. But I'm interested if you have particular thoughts on this. So, so the gender sensitive parliaments, if you remember, I said it was a foremother to this idea of feminist democratic design. It comes from the Interparliamentary Union, but in fact, actually even predates that with a Commonwealth Parliamentarians report in 2000. But really it was the IPU, the Interparliamentary Union's work and the work of Sonia Palmieri in the, in the 20, um, 2000s that really put this on the international agenda. But I was really confronted by hostility to the idea of gender. This is the here gender, see women, think discrimination against men's special treatment for women rationale that I was confronted the first time I spoke formally within Parliament to those beyond whom I'd already met or who I knew was broadly sympathetic. So they contested the use of gender immediately. And I had thought that by wrapping my work in this international institution's idea that I would protect myself from seeing, being seen as extreme. But actually, gender, nonetheless, was contested directly. Now, in shifting to diversity, of course, there is a great deal to be said about what that also does, which is to recognise that women are not the only group who are underrepresented in politics. So there's an intellectual rationale for it. But I think there are still questions raised as to what might be gained and lost by that shift. And also, you might want to, because subsequent to the Good Parliament report, I've worked on other uh, guidelines and a primer for UN women and for the CPA, CWP, and I've shifted back to gender sensitive parliament. So I think there's a very interesting idea about how easily one can move between those two terms and does that actually conceptually throw up questions that I manage to ignore when I'm doing my practical work because it's, it's sort of tactical, but whether one can justify it more profoundly is an interesting question. And these are just some of the I think obvious questions, do you lose the focus on women, on gender power, and also fall short on diversity? So it's quite, you know, you could easily undertake a diversity, perhaps sensitive critique of my work, even though I'm using that, so I find that quite interesting. But all the time, and this goes back to that very early point I made about the Good Parliament Report being a very strategic political document, I was always trying to depoliticize the reception of this report whilst protecting its feminist content. So that's the justification. Whether you find that compelling, I think, is another question. Uh, but leave it to the Q&A so you don't have a go now at this point as I move. So talked about institutionalization, but really it's, it, it's the crux of the success, it seems to me, over time. But thinking about the ways in which this report through the Commons Reference Group did lead to, I would argue, quite significant change to the British Parliament. Now, I guess I would say that, but if you'd have told me that, that we achieved what we did achieve at the time I was trying to convince the then my university to give me some money to do this, I would never have said we'd have got as many things through. So in lots of ways, I think the moment was good. But these are the kind of ways of understanding what happened and how some of that change occurred. So what I'm trying to do as I speak to you about these kind of very practical reflections is for you to think about how when I was talking about feminist democratic representation and transforming institutions at that sort of more general level to think about what kind of actors and dynamics need to be introduced or nurtured, protected, enhanced to bring about something that's better that can redress that poverty of women's representation. So what was quite clear from the Good Parliament report was that we was able to create a shared agenda for change. So not to suggest that everybody agreed on everything, but I'd given them some 40 recommendations. I was told by my secret clock to uh, slaughter a few more darlings, is how he put it. That is going in the next book, right, because it's such a wonderful coin. You know, you don't have this many recommendations. Parliament doesn't like lots of recommendations. MPs just want a handful. They can manage that. And I just refuse 
Okay, I can think back to that notion of academic arrogance. Three changes to the British House of Commons would not transform it into a diversity sensitive institution, right? It's thoroughly saturated by gender power. And those gender power relations need transforming. Nor would I prioritize. For me, it was about giving the institution the responsibility. But I had created the potential for a shared agenda. So that group, that reference group, could look at my report and actually decide where would it put its focus. I mean, weirdly enough, the first thing they did was, was to ask me to define what a good parliament was. And I sort of said, I've just written 40,000 words on it, you could read it. And in fact, they wanted me to prioritise. But that also tells you about the kind of, the ways you have to concede when you're trying to act and trying to bring about change. So a shared agenda. This concept of gendered parliamentarianism, I think, is, is something that I had not necessarily I guess it's, it's, it's a new concept and it's challenging the way we think about how in parliamentary politics we mostly look at relations between the executive and the legislature and parliamentarianism is about the extent to which people as members of the legislature act together against their front benches, against their party leaders and against the executive. What I'm suggesting is that gendered parliamentarianism is where women MPs from cross parties work together, collaborate, recognise an agenda, an agendered agenda and decide they will work to regender it. There's lots of gender in there and they're all intended. Okay, so gender parliamentarianism, women working across party as women and for women, seeing the institution as a workplace, seeing that its ways, its procedures, its norms constrain their effectiveness as members of parliament. So it's not just about coming together over policy, but it's about seeing their institution as highly masculinized and wanting to transform it. So a new kind of way of understanding how members of, a, of the legislature come together. Now, gendered executive suggests also in a way that parliamentarianism wouldn't, because that the opposition in, par in parliamentarianism is between the executive and the legislature, members of the government and members of the parliament. But a gendered executive goes beyond even women who are ordinary members of parliament coming together, but it begins to see relationships working together between members who are women in the government and women backbenchers, whether that's whips, whether that's cabinet ministers, whether it might even be the prime ministers. When we think about, as I have done and written a, a chapter on baby leave, so one of the reforms was to provide some kind of leave for new mothers and new fathers in the House of Commons. It wasn't previously uh, it was all done rather secretly and rather hidden and um, really problematically. But actually in that case study, you see the gender executive coming into play. So again, really important. Can't rule out critical actors and male allies. In an institution where those in powerful positions are disproportionately men, you're going to need to use them. Sometimes it's very useful to use them. Why should we do all the work? Why should all the cost fall onto the women to change our institutions? I mean, that's an assumption we really need to play around with and reject. But also that new institution, I've mentioned it, I'll just skip over it here. But I do want to talk again about this, another dynamic that I think had not appreciated before I was there and observing it and being part of the institution, a sort of coalescence between the administrative and the political side. So particularly middle ranking women clerks and officials who also saw this institution as a gendered institution, as a workplace that constrained them. Working with women members of parliament to bring about change. And you wouldn't normally have seen that. So all of these kind of observations, if you were following the, the sort of traditional, seeing the ungendered literature on institutional change in the House of Commons, you just wouldn't see these kind of findings. It would tell you to look elsewhere. But actually when you put on your gendered specs, you begin to see these kind of dynamics. We also deployed women's civil society and the media to write opinion pieces, to try to create a demand externally that could be used. Let me try to, as my final reflection, think about this identity as the feminist academic critical actor. So this is a rather old picture of me, it was old even when they used it in the Daily Mail. Um, it's an old University of Bristol picture. Um, you can just tell from the change of the glasses shape really how old these things are. So I said that there was this category I was trying to, and I am, advocating that when we think about the role of the impactful academic, 
within the ways in which we understand institutional change, particularly within feminist institutionalism and the work in gender and politics around critical mass and critical actors, is there something, someone called the feminist academic critical actor? So she's obviously got to be demonstrated, right? It's an empirical question whether she exists in a particular case. But I think we might want to begin to think of her linking this work back to the feminist democratic representation work as a feminist designer builder. And by naming her, she becomes the subject as well as the analyst of research. I think that's where she might be distinct from some of the other ways in which relationships between women outside of institutions and within institutions have been conceptualized and theorized. So there is talk of feminist critical friends, for example, and others have described me in that kind of way. But what I think is quite interesting is this idea of being the subject. So you have to actually analyze your own role. You're not just supporting others. I used the phrase before, instigating and instituting gendered change. So she's an actor who wants to exploit the potential opportunities by bringing her outsider experiences and expertise inside. So she's living a parliamentary life of sorts, but nonetheless, she is distinct from those other actors. And it seems to me she needs, therefore, some kind of name that makes her distinct. So she's bringing democratic feminine or feminist democratic design principles to the situation. She's trying to do this thing called impactful research. But her work might be risky in both academic and personal terms. So in a previous part of this lecture, I talked about the feminist imperative to transform the world, but I'm also intrigued, perhaps troubled at the risks, the gendered risks of being a public actor and of being in the public profile and just being at the mercy sometimes of other people's battles. So this isn't really a story about me. This is a story of the institution. It's about the then speaker, our colleague here, John Burko. This is just a way of getting at him, but I'm a useful way to get at him. And then I rather love this story that they managed to find that I once said you should ban pink at the end of a public talk in Bristol decades ago, where it was the last question. Everyone, you know, it was a, it was a public, I think it was, a, it was actually with Sean Norris, who's a, an independent um, journalist or writer that you might see on Twitter. And she did, it was part of the feminist, Bristol Feminist Literary Festival. And it was a lot, you know, just, everyone was going, right? And they said, what's the one thing you would do to change the world? So I just had a throwaway comment. I just banned pink. Somehow, <laughs> somebody dug that up. And that's what I, that's what's wrong with me. But if you also, and you can't read that from here, I do have the original, I think my brother has the original in Germany. I keep trying to remember where to bring it back, but I keep forgetting. Um, given how much he loses things, it's quite amazing. He's managed to keep this newspaper. But they actually also try to, and this repeats something I've been saying a number of times in this talk, undermine my credibility. I didn't go to the best kind of university to do my PhD. And they make something of that. So they're undermining my credibility, my credentials, my feminist knowledge in a very public fashion. Now, I think, some, you know, given what we know about women in the public, in public life being subject to hostility, I got away very lightly. But I think it's really important that we recognise that when we ask academics to engage in this kind of research or when academics want to engage in this kind of research, there are risks that perhaps we haven't really thought through. And whilst I don't wish to dissuade anyone from being or accepting that feminist imperative to transform and change the world around them as well as study it, I think as an institution, the, the academy needs to recognise those risks. It's also important that in naming where we can the feminist academic critical actor, we do so because otherwise her role gets lost. And again, that's very important to reveal and to register and to recognize those kind of things. So my final statement really is, when we think about how we might want our representative democracies, our elected representative institutions, we need to really think about both the principles under which we might want them to be organised. But if we're going out into the, what we might call the real world, we have to recognise that we make everyday concessions, that we are producing work. You know, you might read the Good Parliament Report. If you're doing the module on Parliament, you will, or at least you'll read the executive summary because 40,000 words is quite a lot to read. It's boring. I've told you that already. It's dry, right? It's dry. 
not the best read in the world. But you'll see some of the concessions I made. I hid a couple of the recommendations. Breastfeeding is hidden. It's not a numbered recommendation. It's not bullet pointed. It's hidden discreetly in a paragraph, but it's there. 43, it's a funny number, right? That's 44. The other one was about MPs job share. It's in a footnote. I can't decide whether it's elegant or inelegantly addressed in a footnote, but it's there because it was too costly. So to think about as academics, we might sometimes have the freedom to write what we want to write. Other times we're engaged in very messy, dirty work on the ground. But I think the idea of refashioning our political institutions is so important because the poverty of women's representation is not only still evident, it might be increasingly under threat as we have democratic backsliding, backlash, authoritarianism and populism. And that's why I think it matters that our institutions are both democratic, but most fundamentally as well, feminist, because if you're not feminist, you can't be democratic. I'm going to end there. Thanks very much. <laughs>